The following podcast is taken from a live broadcast on Inspire FM. Assalamu alaikum and welcome. You are listening live to Inspire Radio. This is the Welcome to Islam show. This is the platform for new Muslims in the local community. Um, as you know, once a month, Luton Revert Group come into the studio and we take over the Welcome to Islam show. Um, and today I'm joined, as usual, by, by my lovely sisters, Jeanette and Catherine. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam. Wa alaikum salam. So uh, tonight we have a very interesting topic. Um, this is one that not necessarily uh, for new Muslims. This is for, for all of the community, but we feel quite strongly about it as a group. So we thought we would like to talk about it this, e- this evening. And we also have um, a special guest um, going to be calling into the studio in the second half of our show. So the um, topic for tonight is environmental action in Islam. Um, and the reason that we are talking about this is because we all know that climate change is real um, and there are many factors that uh, are, are the reason for this and we'll go into this in more discussion. Um, and we'd like to kind of introduce um, what the uh, Quran and the Sunnah is around respecting our environment. So we'll be exploring that in our discussion. And like I said, uh, in the second part of the show, we also have a special guest, um, Motahir Rahman from Extinction Rebellion, which is a social movement um, to uh, try and affect change. So, um, Catherine, can I defer to you to start our discussion about why we're talking about this topic this evening? Inshallah, yes. Uh, So as... As Kerry said, um, we're all aware of what's going on in the world. We see it on the news every day, um, floods, wildfires, climate change uh, impacting us uh, here in the UK and um, in in all different parts of the world. Um, And it's not only climate change that is the problem. Um, In in many ways, we could say that climate change is is actually the symptom of of a much bigger um, issue um, where uh, exploitation and oppression um, is the root cause. So in our revert group, we've um, often, when we have our events, we we think about, for example, when we when we're organising catering for our uh, our events um, at the iftar, the last iftar we did, uh, we encouraged people to bring their own plates and cutlery. Yeah, and av- that worked really well, actually, yeah, didn't it? Yeah, mm-hmm. to avoid the use of single-use plastics, it, it worked really well. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, when we have our, um, our monthly meeting, we um, bring our cups. We we avoid use of paper cups or plastic cups, and we try to bring our own cups and the supply of our own cups again to avoid the use of single use single use plastics. Um, and there's a lot we're hearing about um, uh, social movements, XR rebellion, and then we have Greta Thunberg, who's um, led a worldwide movement, really, um, for, from young people's perspective. As well, mm. so maybe we'd, it would be good to start with what the Quran says about these these sort of situations. Um, so I'm not able to read it in Arabic, inshallah. So this is a trans a translation. So Quran um, chapter thirty verse forty one says, "Corruption has appeared in the land and sea because of what the hands of men have earned." that God may give them a taste of some of their deeds in order that they may find their way back to the right path. Mm. That's quite an interesting one, really, yes. isn't it? Because I think that's kind of telling us right there that you kind of reap what you sow, but use yeah. this as a way to kind of <clears throat> realise what you've done and come back, come yes. back. So and, a wake-up call. And, yeah, a wake-up yes. call and adjust your ways, you yeah. know, to, to make up for that. Yes, because corruption, in the English word corruption, is everything from political fraud, illegal banking, litter, litter on a small scale, a large scale. We have these islands of plastic that are floating around mm, the oceans, yeah. um, deforestation, pesticides. Um, and it's, it's, we tend to think that it's somebody, else, somebody else's job to sort it out, yeah. um, whether that's government or politicians or society. Um, 
But really, we all have an individual mm-hmm. responsibility mm-hmm. as well as the, a collective responsibility. Yes. Yeah, and I think some of the things that we'd like to kind of touch on within this show is actually what we can do as individuals yes. to kind of make a difference. Yes. Mm-hmm. And Inshallah. again, Quran, uh, chapter 23, verse 71. If truth followed humanity's desires, the heavens and the earth and everything within them would be corrupted. Nay, we have come to them with their remembrance and they turn away from their remembrance. So man's mm. desires leads mm. us mm. in a corruption. <laughs> corruption. Yeah. And an, the, another from the Quran, chapter 13, verse 11, Allah does not change men, men's condition unless they change their inner selves. Mm. So we, we need to start from ourselves, really. I think that's a big verse, that one. The fact that, that works on a lot, a lot of people, yes. well, yeah, a lot of people think, well, you know, it's, uh, it's Allah's choice, it's Allah's decision, yes. it's Allah's his will. plan, yes. it's his will. Yes. But actually, we have that ability to affect that will with our own practices. Mm. And what we do as an individual mm. can make those big changes. Yeah, because I'm sure I've, I've seen, I recall something else similar about a uh, nation. Refer, a similar quote from the Quran. Yeah, it about, does not change a nation. Yes, is, is the yes. translation. Yes. yes. Yeah, yes, and it, so it works on on so many different levels. Yes. That quote, and it, and it just it, it's a really potent point actually that we kind of can't just rely on others or even Allah to make the change. We have to start it ourselves. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's like when everybody says, inshallah, inshallah, yeah. inshallah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if Allah wills, but it's if Allah wills and you, you will. put something in yes. action. It it's, to, yeah. it's effort. It's yeah. Really mm-hmm. it's mm-hmm. Exactly. So the Quran, in the Quran, there's a very strong concept of um, khalifa, which is translated in many different ways, uh, but it's, it's commonly understood as, as sort of stewardship. So, chapter 33, verse 72. We offered the trust to the heavens and the earth and the mountains, and they declined to bear it. But man undertook to bear it. Indeed, in, he was unjust and ignorant. Um, so, yes, yeah, Khalifa is this, um, sure. gives us a steward that we have responsibility to look after the planet. Um, mm. Again, chapter 6, um, verse 615. Um, it is he who has made you successors upon the earth and has raised you, some of you above others in degrees, that he may try you through what he has given you. So this idea of Khalifa, I think there's been a lot written and considered about this. Um, and it is, uh, we, have, we have stewardship, we have responsibility, we have knowledge, um, we can observe um, what is going on in the in the earth and what what the earth needs and how to look after it? Mm. I mean, because I mean, we have been told as well, haven't we? About you know, we need to sort things out and we need yeah. to do it by this kind of timeline. Otherwise, we get past the point of no return. Yes. Mm-hmm. So yes. we are able to assess that and see for ourselves. Yes. I mean, it's it's um, Allah's way. Of, it's another test for us, isn't it? Mm. He's given us the warning already in the in the surahs you've re, you've mm. already recited. You know that we have to make the changes, mm. and it's our test to respond to that. And that's what's really important. That's the message we want to get out today. Yeah. Really. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So there are some um, actions we can do following the sunnah mm-hmm. of our Prophet Ali Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Um, big one, use less water. Mm. Minimise the use of water. Uh, yeah, we're even told the, about for wudu, aren't we, about yeah, how much yes. water we should use. It's yes. amazing, actually. You watch people doing wudu and the amount of water that just runs and runs mm. and runs while yeah. they're doing the wudu. But my husband told me when he went on hajj, he was taught that they only used like a cup of water. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I just think, wow. And actually, it taught me as well, because like, you know, when you're washing your feet, mm. you run the tap over you and then actually I learned... No, I don't and do actually, it's quite a useful it's skill easier. because then you can do what do on the go. <laughs> exactly. Yes. You know, if you can do it with just a little bottle of water, mm-hmm. you can keep that in your handbag exactly. and then exactly. you can do it anywhere without making too much of a mess. You know, we've That's all been true. in the bathrooms where people have done what do and oh. there's water everywhere. And, and bear in mind, yeah. it's only in the last, I don't know, 100, maybe 200 years we've had plumbing and pipes mm, and taps yeah. and all this around. Good point. Our, our brothers and sisters before us, they... they, they Manage much more efficiently. Mm. Um, and yeah, we've come a bit complacent, hasn't yes. we? Oh, well, it's just on tap, literally. Mm. Just on tap, mm. let's just let it run. Yeah. So the next one is about gardens and planting. 
um, and there's a there's a hadith that even if it's in, I, I I can't get the exact quote, but even if it's in the last hour of time, if you have a seed or a, a, um, a seedling, mm. plant it. Mm. It's never too late. Yeah, and yeah. actually planting things is sadaka jaria, isn't it? Yes, yeah. continuing yes. charity even after you've passed. Yeah, I do keep trying to have my plants, but. I've got to admit, I'm not the best of gardeners, but yeah. I am determined, and I do keep trying. And, and if we do, if we do have the the blessing and privilege of having mm-hmm. a patch of land that we are responsible for, so that patch of land, that I don't know, however many meters it is on the earth, going all the way down and all the way up, yeah. that is your responsibility. Mm-hmm. It's don't so, just tarmac it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. You know, we it's pave things it's over. It's true, actually. So many do it just because it's easier to maintain. Yeah, and we park then, our cars on it, and yeah, we all yeah. know how cars are for but the then environment. You, and right. you change, then you change the the water table level, and you mm. get flooding, and mm-hmm. and and there's no trees. Yeah, yeah I mean, even in the point. UK now, I mean, we've been having these ecological disasters, you know, in other parts of the world for a few years now, but now. I think it's even in the home. UK, yeah. we're starting mm-hmm. to get all this flooding, um, you know, and it's it's quite scary. It is. Yeah. I mean, we're having, you know, we can have one day where, um, I don't know if you remember, but we have had days recently in the last year or so where we've had almost every type of weather, mm. from the hail to the rain. God, we've had hail sun. like almost like golf balls. Yeah. Yes. yeah. And you think, whoa, this is not meant to happen here. Mm. And the temperatures have been rising and it's like we've been having temperatures where I only ever experienced when I went abroad mm. and got off the mm. plane. Mm. Mm. Like, and in wow. other parts, I mean, in Australia now, it's oh, all the bush fires. fires and the whole thing's on fire. Mm. It's, it's, yeah. If we don't do anything, just a little thing. If we don't do it at all, yeah, don't do that little thing. Then it's just going to get worse. Mm. And, and I think, worse. I think, like I was saying about the fact that it's been happening in in the developing countries. Yeah. You know, we've been complacent because it's not hit our own doorstep. Mm. You know, but it, now it is. Although, having said that, many Muslims have relatives and family and roots. In these okay. countries that are really adversely mm. affected. Mm, mm, um, yeah. So we're blessed that we have that, that bit of connection yeah. and that um, that should make us more aware, really, and, and more inclined to, to take action of some sort. Um, so the ne- next one is about respecting animals, looking after animals, taking care of them. Yeah. Um, there's many hadiths in this respect. Mm. Um, and alongside that, animals... Um, Looking after animals that we're going to be eating. It's not just the halal and the no. slaughter. It's the whole how they're reared, nurtured, reared looked after, looked yep. after um, that is so important. I mean, there's so many stories. I remember telling my children when they were little about looking after the animals. I mean, oh, just thinking off the top of my head, there's the one with, is it the dog? Yes, and where the they well. give the daughter, the dog, some water. Yeah, yeah, and literally, it's taking their slipper off, mm. filling it with water to feed the dog. And I think that lady, that she was, she went to paradise because of that. Mm-hmm. And yeah. her, there was somebody who didn't do something. I think it was for a cat this time. Yeah, and she, even though she was, she did many other good things. She, she went yeah. to hell because of, she didn't do something. Well, if you think about it, with the animals, we're all part of this big cycle. We've mm. just been watching. Um, uh, the big hunt, watching the animals and how they survive, and you know, my kids are like, "Oh, that little bird's been eaten by the fox," and I'm like, mm. "Yeah, but it's all natural and it's balanced." And they you don't go and kill lords; they just do what they, they, they just do what they, they need. need. If we only could follow their yes. example, yes, yeah. yeah. And so, when part, the next one going on from that is is about what we eat. Yeah. yeah. Really, we need to raise our consciousness about what we're eating and how much much we're eating. Um, and yes, we need to all be eating less meat um, than than we have been. Yeah, I think um, one of the things that I was looking at when I was researching for tonight was that the meat and dairy sector is one of the most important contributors towards climate yeah. change. And yeah. I read this thing about it said, if cattle were their own nation, they would be the world's third largest emitter of greenhouse gases after china and us wow. <laughs> and i was just like whoa okay yeah. that's just the cattle that but we they're eat all, yeah they're bred just for us to eat yeah and the thing is as well is that it's, they're not even it's not even locally sourced no, no one of the things that we really could do to help with the uh 
the emergency is to source food locally Absolutely, yes. rather than getting our land from New Zealand and you know yeah, whatever else absolutely. you know is to uh, and eat seasonally as well yes. I mean that's more obviously for fruit and vegetables but you know eating local and, and eating seasonally I think some Much meats is seasonally as well. as well if you think about your lamb yeah mm. You know, yeah, that's true. Mm. It's much healthier to eat locally because the locally grown food has the local, I don't know, antibodies, etc., around yeah, the that's environment. True. And it's, um, you know, what what is in your locality is what you need. In theory, we maybe in Britain not supposed to eat pineapples. No, you, know, you could say. Mm. You know, mm, the, 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 what is in the land is suited to the climate, and we're in that climate. So it's, it's, it's an interesting point because, to mm. be honest, when I was little, I don't remember half the things that we have no. now. Mm. I mean, and not all the time either. No. You can literally get strawberries all year. year. Yeah. Mm. And, and they don't taste nice all year. They no. only actually taste really good when it's in the right season. And those strawberries might be grown in Egypt. Mm. That would be... Yeah. You know. And actually, <laughs> Egypt, I don't think, is supposed to be growing strawberries. No, no. <laughs> and it's all in the... the we've all... I mean, when I... I Yes, I've flown in airplanes to Spain and you see the miles and miles and miles of greenhouses mm. where all the aubergines and tomatoes, it's just goes, it's, yeah, it's mm. shocking and really. We are blessed to have all this variety of food, but we really do need to think, do we need it? Mm. Do we need all that? How many generations survived before us yes. with just the regular food and the local food? Mm. And yeah. Mm-hmm. So the next one is about feeding the poor and looking after the poor, supporting. And it's it's not um, it's not just zakat. That's and not just only to Muslims. It's broader than that, much broader. It's um, so. How do you relate this point, Catherine, to the environment? Are you talking about an environment in a holistic perspective when you're talking about feeding the poor? Well, it's it's being conscious that there are people who have much less than us, mm. and. Um, we're all one. We're mm. all, we're all one. We're all on the same mm-hmm. earth, mm. and whatever we can do to redress the balance on that, um, in whatever. Yeah. Whereas way we, can. we have an overabundance and oversupply yes. yeah. of things, and we overconsume. If you then thought, okay, this extra forty percent that I've got, I should give to a, a needy person. Mm. It could be like when you go shopping. Do you need as much as mm. you get? Mm-mm. If you shop properly to what you actually need for mm. each meal. The extra that you have, or even, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but when I've been to Tesco's, there's always a shopping trolley for the homeless, mm. yeah. for the shelters. Mm. Mm. The just putting a little, mm. yeah, food bank, that's it. And I always put some. I there. find a practical, just going with the shopping list and sticking to that, I save yeah. loads of money. If mm. I just go round them, you get, and you get yeah, tempted yeah, yes, and yes. you see things. Yes. And like, oh, those but, offers. <laughs> just, yeah, I mean, I don't know environmentally if it's sound, but I've gone to online shopping now right. rather than going to the shop. So um, I do the collect do one where, you know, I order it online. So I'm only buying what I need. You could, that could be, it could be environmental because you've just got one van going yes. to lots of places yes. instead well, of lots what, of cars going yeah. to one place. Yes. What, what, well, I do it online shopping and they actually have greener vans. So you can book the slots, which is for the uh, green. Are they delivery. electric vans, are they? I just well, think it's, I, I'm not yeah. sure, mm. but it just says that it's more economically uh, they just make sure that they have everybody mm. within that mm. area, mm. I assume. Mm. So they're not running up and down different parts of the area. Mm. That's what I'm assuming. And one other thing I just thought of when we were talking about how much we eat and consume is the hadith about um, how much we eat and drink, about filling your stomach one third of food and one yeah. third of water. And how many of us really follow that sunnah? Yeah. You know, if we thought about that every time we prepared a meal... Yeah. How many of us really know what the size of our stomach really is? Yes. And you think about a third and a third. Because I was, somebody told me recently about thinking about your hand. Mm. And just when you look at that, you think, well, that's hardly any food. Yeah. <laughs> How will I really Isn't survive? There, you know? Is there a hadith um, to eat just as, um, enough so that you're not feeling hungry anymore or just so that you can stand yeah. up? Mm. I think you know? we know when we've overeaten, don't we? Because oh. you feel lethargic afterwards. And I'm sure and... a lot of people have had that feeling over the last few days. Oh, yes, mm. of overindulging. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so... Th- Moving on, um, the next one is is environmental action. So I think we'll be talking more about this on the on, in the next part. And and this is can be is is seen as sort of an act of worship in a way. Um, 
So I think we'll be talking about that with, with Brother Martha here in, in a little while. And again, re read, read the Quran, reflect on Allah's uh, creation and, and the Quran and what it says. So many things in the Quran talk about creation and the mountains and how they're formed and the you know you have to reflect on what is there and mm. it's, it's all signs for us i think to be i think this earth in itself is just such a miracle and i don't think enough of us actually take that time to appreciate this gift that we've been given the earth in itself mm. is our mother almost you know it nourishes us yes and sustains us all obviously by allah's subhanahu wa ta'ala's design um, but, you know, I don't think we appreciate yeah. that gift as much as we should. And, and it's the only one we've got. Yeah. Yeah, there's no plan B. No. I think, I, I can't remember if that's Greenpeace or that I'm the, quoting I think there. it's Marks and Spencer's, isn't it? I, I don't know. know. I don't know. There's no plan B. I just remember seeing that thinking, oh, that's quite, but that's quite a good one. So it might be useful to hear. So there is this, um, a lot of people say, well, I recycle, you know, that's that's, mm. that's okay. I do my it? bit. I do my bit. Mm. But actually, mm. it's if you're at the point where you're recycling something, it's actually... A bit too late it's in the too chain. late. Mm. Yeah. And there's, um, I think it's come from America, actually, these sort of, um, it's called sustainability goals. And they all begin with R. So first of all is there's rethink whether you whether you really need something that you can refuse to buy it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um reduce reuse repurpose return take something back if mm -hmm. if you've if not you got need home it. and realize you don't yes. need it mm -hmm. um refill yeah there's lots of possible lots of the supermarkets and there's lots of we don't have to buy the whole new container you can just buy the ingredients mm -hmm. <clears throat> and rot as well composting things like that mm. and i think what struck with me there's a, a this we use the term throw away there is no away there's no, no it's away gonna go it's going to go somewhere on this planet yes, yes. um yeah you put it in the a bin, big hole the somewhere bin where it's outside on a, yes but it's still there it's nonetheless still there. it's going to come back to bite us on the butt yes and it is mm. it is mm. this is the bite now with all i mean i i don't know about you even within luton I'm just finding that, I mean, and I don't know if it's because of the fact that they've reduced the amount of bin collections they've done and that kind of thing, but the amount of rubbish that's on the street, mm. and I, I just find it so upsetting to walk around our streets and see so much gum on the floor, rubbish blowing yeah. around, dumped on the corners, and it's... I I just think, there is oh. a, a, a quite an important debate about um, what councils do and what people can do. So, yes, they, a lot of areas they've... Um, They've decreased the number of bin collections. Mm. Done it. Um, mm. But not everybody finds it easy to go to the tip. Yeah. You know, they're on the outside of town. You have to have a car to get there, you mm. know, to take mm. rubbish there. Um, yeah, because I don't yeah. know if actually reducing the amount of bin collections has actually forced people to no. produce any le less waste. No. I think it's just mm. creating a, a mountain. A, big, a bigger pile. <laughs> at home <laughs> where it's stinking and, you know, causing rats yes. and all sorts of other pr issues. Yeah, just uh, for the sake of saving a bit of money for the local council. Yeah, this is sort of it's, sort of sizes, really. I don't what, know. When I was looking at, you know, like we have the brown bin, and obviously that's mm. not being collected at the time. Mm. Um, and I was thinking, well, why can't we put our waste food in there? Mm. You know, like you know, potatoes that nobody's mm. eaten and, and they're not going to get eaten, or peelings. Mm. You mm. know, yeah, tea bags. You can yeah. compost tea bags. Not all tea bags. But, not, no, no, but not. I think the leaves in. you can. Yeah, so you yeah. can open it up, but most tea yeah. bags have got, got um, the plastic. But you can't yeah. put any of that in your brown bin. No. You can only you see, put different, lo puttings. different lo councils have yeah. different rules. Mm. Where yeah. I live, they don't collect oh, any Oh, even glass. just for the recycling, yes. there's so many yes. different... Yes. Yeah. Um, I know where, I'm, where, where I lived before I moved down here, you couldn't recycle half the yeah. things you can yeah. here. Mm. And there's also lots of concern that actually you could put everything in the recycling bin and it all goes off, but actually it, it doesn't really get... You know, only a lot of it gets rejected. Yeah, 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 because you haven't cleaned it properly or you haven't separated it right. You yeah. know, like even milk bottles, you're supposed yeah. to take off the lid. Yeah, yeah. take the I label, take, take the paper label off yeah. cans. Yes, um, I've never, I didn't know that. So that's something that hasn't been passed on to me. Yeah. Mm. And there's lots of things we use that are so difficult, like biros, for example. There's so many bits in them. When a biro runs out, mm. you just put it in. The, mm. no, it, mm. it, it can't, you can't do anything with it. Yeah. Um, Oh, there's just, it's just, it's just so a minefield. Yeah. yeah, so just avoid. 
<laughs> if you can get a pencil yeah. rather than a biro to pencils. <laughs> Um, yeah. I'm uh, not sure that would work for me in my career. <laughs> <laughs> I need to have my pinks have... and greens. Yes, yes, for doing your marking. <laughs> Jeanette's is... a teacher, if anyone <laughs> didn't know. Yes. But it's a good point. It's a good point. Yeah, we definitely. need to look at alternatives, oh, wherever yeah, we, we are. So um, we're coming up to a break now. Um, I hope that uh, the first part of the discussion has been interesting for our listeners. So you are listening to the Welcome to Islam show, which is a platform for new Muslims. Live on Inspire FM. If anyone wants to call into the show, it's 01582 481 822. We are having a guest after the break, uh, Mothahir Rahman from um, Re- Extinction Rebellion. A uh, bit of a mouthful there for me. Um, and so we l- really look forward to speaking to him and hearing his insight and what we can do locally and as Muslims to help the environment. Assalamu alaikum. You're listening to an Inspire FM podcast, making available our popular programs from our daily broadcast on Inspire FM. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back. This is the Welcome to Islam show. This is a platform for new Muslims. My name is Kerry, I'm your host, and I'm in the studio live with Catherine and Jeanette. As-salamu alaykum. Oh, alaykum alaykum salam. So our topic this evening is environmental action in Islam, um, and we had quite an interesting talk before the break, um, and we now are going to have a guest speaker uh, who, inshallah, will impart some pearls of wisdom. Uh, So this is Mutahir Rahman. Uh, He joined Extinction Rebellion in September 2018, becoming part of its political strategy team and was a core member for the April 2019 rebellion. XR Muslims raises awareness of the climate and ecological emergency in collaboration with Muslim organisations working at grassroots levels. It aims to actively listen to Muslims and Muslim organisations and act as a bridge between them and regional Extinction Rebellion groups to help shape a political language that can talk about the climate and ecological emergency from a multiplicity of Islamic perspectives. XR Muslims wants Extinction Rebellion to become a more diverse organisation which actively listens to and learns from marginalised communities and culturally diverse voices. So I would like to uh, introduce Motahir Rahman. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you so much, brother, for joining us this evening. Yeah, it's a pleasure. No, so you would you like to advice. just uh, introduce yourself a little bit more than what I've just mentioned and uh, explain a bit more about XR Muslims for us? Yeah, so um, I guess yeah, so I, I was born in uh, Leeds um, and grew up in, uh, um, I suppose, you know, in a sort of normal uh, Muslim family um, and my education, I guess I was, you know, I was in a comprehensive school and uh, quite a, a deprived area actually, economically as well so it's, I think my school was mostly uh, a Muslim um, um, and South Asian uh, cultural place mm-hmm. and, and, and um, I um, my career turned me into, into law and to envi- and I'm wanting to be an environmental lawyer. Um, and the when Extinction Rebellion started, um, I, I I kind of felt there was a sort of a need for uh, after, especially after Brexit as well. I think Brexit really opened broke me for me in some way, like a faith in a particular kind of way of looking at the world. Mm. Uh, this sort of liberal humanism. And it seemed a bit, it was beginning to become empty. And I, when I was looking back in my own faith and culture and thinking, what is, was there something there that could be looked at again for myself? Um, and that's when I, you know, with Extinction Rebellion, looking at sort of decolonial aspects as well, that I thought there was a need um, to bring uh, the faith elements together. So the, the um, Extinction Rebellion was kind of born in. The October Rebellion, when there was a, a group of different faith groups, uh, Extinction Rebellion Jews, Extinction Rebellion Buddhists, and the Christian Climate Action, um, and Exile like Muslims coming together to say, let's let's work together uh, because we have common 
common uh, principles, com- common values, common ways of understanding the the sort of sacred source of life that we need that needs protecting at this diff- at this challenging time. Mm. And I felt just working together from from that principle was a hugely impactful for me as well, and, and I think for all of us working together. Um, and it's grown from there. So since that action in October. Um, the relationships that were created and the energy as well of seeing that we can make a difference if we come together, I think that really caused a, a, ch- a shift as well in one's own sort of way of acting because mm. you start seeing you can make a difference. Okay, to Zakala, brother. So I think we've got some questions that we uh, wanted to ask you just to put you on the mm. spot a little bit and uh, give us your <laughs> wisdom. <laughs> okay, Islam, yeah. come, brother. My name's Jeanette. Um, well, and... Well, so our first question is global warming. We know it's a fact. But is it too late already to change anything? Yeah, there was a, I think one of, I was listening earlier, so one of, uh, one of you said, said the hadith from uh, Mansa Little Long, which was um, if you have a, uh, if it's the end of the world and you have a seed, mm. then mm-hmm. still plant the seed. And that reminds me of this sense of, never to give up like mm. um you know, and the reports the scientific evidence is that we are reaching tipping points so the ipcc the international mm. uh, the governmental uh, report on uh, climate change said we, we're getting very, getting very close to these tipping points and prob- we may even have reached overshot them we don't know yet um, because there's that uncertainty but we can still act to make a difference and we can still come together to to reduce and to adapt as well so it's not i guess necessarily always not just changing um uh reducing but also adapting and i suppose as well you're working on current um criteria in terms of what you know what knowledge you know and what technology we've got who knows what technology might occur tomorrow that could mean that the difference that you know just to reverse a few more years yeah there, i mean there is um in current plans they're already making commitments that uh, we don't have like carbon capture technology the, this is already being included into the prediction that we're going to meet the, the the reductions but this technology mm. isn't even here yet and they're making the predictions as if it already existed oh, gosh. And that's, <laughs> <a danger. laughs> that's worrying <laughs> can be yeah. That. Yeah, so it's like uh, like with nuclear waste as well. Thing we, we've got, we, we will have capacity in the future to put this away somewhere, but then we haven't got an away place to put put it yet. Mm. So it's uh, there is no way. And having the there can be a real faith in that something can change, but there can also be a false sense of faith. I think that technology will somehow so save, save the day. And yeah, can, and, yeah, and we don't have to change our lifestyles. We can just mm, continue mm. the lifestyles we have. Um, and it's not just necessarily as well, just, just on that question about necessarily just changing our own lifestyle. Like, I think the media often like to to, to say the ordinary person is going to have to change their lifestyle. Mm. But um, the evidence shows, Professor Tim Jackson is a professor in um, Manchester University. He's trying to bring out this perspective that it's about climate justice, not just about climate change. Yeah. And the justice is about the equity aspect. And he made these statistics, that tables, just to like work out what the CO2 emissions are against wealth. About who the, and so you find out the most, the ten percent most wealthy of the world, I think, used about used about sixty percent of the global emissions. Like, in the, and, and are you talking uh, about it, individuals, or are you talking about corporations? There. This was just indivi- uh, the. the Individual. So you're saying uh, Bill Gates is a major level. polluter because of his because of his business dealings? Is that effectively because what you're saying, or, or am I oversimplifying? Yeah, I think he, he's so he's looking at um, our consumption level um, as individuals. So mm. the number of flights you use, uh, yeah. how often you might go, and it was just so showing that ten percent of the global population. Um, if, if if they were just reduced to the EU average, then that would cut global emissions by itself of, of, of on personal consumption levels by a third. Wow, that's so, really interesting. You wouldn't think that such a few individuals could have such an impact. Ten percent of the globe, yeah. It's a, I mean, it's, it's 
looking at where where the I guess where the I mean that includes the whole world. So, I mean we're, we'll be included in that as well. I suppose lots of people in the in the UK because wealth is just so stratified at the moment between the the, the those who have the least and those who have the, the most. Mm. But we've got a very unequal world, and that's just something that we um, have to yeah keep in our conscience mm. that this is a global global impact. Mm. So those most least who've done the least in, in, in third world countries will be the most impacted mm. and are being the most impacted. Yeah, and, and and if you think about it, those in the third world who are living hand to mouth, they're not really going to be able to affect any significant amount of changes as an individual because they're already living at a very basic level. I mean, you know, they, you could ask them to try and make perhaps a dietary change, but, you know, when <laughs> you're already, already when you're already eating rice and beans mm. or whatever... Uh, mm. no, the illness you know, is on us in the it, West, it kind of it? yeah, it kind of comes back to the fact that it is the privileged that kind of are the key to this. <laughs> to, to making yeah, the, and as Muslims, I guess there's many of us in this in England who have uh, ancestries um, from from many of those third world countries, which are being impacted. Like Bang, my ancestors come from Bangladesh, and Bangladesh is going to be one of the most impacted. Uh, countries from uh, from the climate and mm. the well, they already are, aren't they? Because of all the flooding well, and yeah. Mm. yeah. Mm. Mm. Okay, so I mean, talking then about as individuals, what can we do as individuals? What difference can we make? Yeah, I was, I was just finding this quote that often used on on, on Facebook by Margaret Mead, who's an anthropologist, um, and it said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Mm. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Mm. And she was bringing the point that often social movements come from individuals um, coming together and collectivizing. Mm. Um, In England, I was just thinking, uh, uh, the Rochdale pioneers, that they they were the... um, people who started the, the co-op movement in the 19th century, 1850s in Rochdale. And uh, that was because of hunger and poverty and and recognising that they, they needed to come together to, to sell their own, because the weights were not being done properly by the people in the shops, so they came together to, to sell their own food and make their own food and sell it and, uh, in a cooperative structure with certain principles. And that idea of when we come together, we can do much more. I think is something that's inherent as well in, in, mm. in Islam as well of mm. this collectivization. So we can begin to, I think, take ourselves outside the mindset of this idea of being a consumer. So consumerism makes us think, oh, we, we're a consumer. Whereas when we think of ourselves as a citizen, then we, it widens our understanding of what it means to be you know, in society. Uh, and then we might begin to think about things a bit differently not just about our rights and the rights to, to buy, but also our responsibilities as citizens. Mm-hmm. But do you, think, do you think the message is getting through? I mean, we all know about climate change, but as individuals, yeah. do you think the message is going through about what we can actually do? I think a lot of people think it's too late already, I can't really make changes in my life as an individual that's going to really make a change. Do you think maybe it's just not getting, the message isn't getting through? There's an article, well, yeah, I'm just thinking about it, because it feels sometimes that there's often, like the climate movement has started from this idea of, because it starts from this, often this, or has been started from this idea of, as a consumer, as consumer-driven change, hmm. we have to make the difference ourselves. But what Extinction Rebellion is trying to show is that this is almost a false distraction, hmm. that the amount of changes we can make as individuals is never going to be sufficient. What is needed is 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 the changes at the level of the corporations mm. of government where they and it's like what are we willing to accept as a change like you know and then it becomes different if if we had these if we had policies in place and if we had a government that was actually willing to actually treat this as a climate and ecological emergency and put in place similar laws and rules that were done during the second world war when the whole industries were changed you know to meet the needs of of that of the second world war you know and, mm. and now if we have that kind of driven government driven change then we would begin to uh, yeah i mean it's interesting that that analogy because you know you're saying about the second world war if you think about how it was at wartime here in the uk Mm -hmm. the whole country was geared up ready 
you know, ready to do whatever it took. Every, you know, people gave up their jobs. People you know, changed their whole lives around what was happening for war. And mm. I'm not quite sure that that message is getting out to the people to say, actually, this is on this kind of level. Mm. I don't know if it's just a lack yeah. of motivation or a lack of awareness. The, these are the, the, the three demands of Extinction Rebellion when it started. The first demand was tell, for the government to tell the truth about the about the, the scale mm. of, of the climate and ecological emergency. And before even Extinction Rebellion started, we didn't have the, the words climate and ecological emergency. It was all about climate, uh, sustainable development, you know, creating de- you know, development, but not. Um, but still, the development needs were trumping sustainability. And then mm. after, you know, we had the, uh, the first rebellion in April, and at the, ta- at the beginning of that, the media were saying, well, what's the... You know what are you what are you protesting about? And it, it was kind of quite negative. But then, as, as it became more and more clear that the scale of the uh, of the re- what the reports were showing about the need to act now, that that the message in the media began to change. And then there was a meeting with Michael Gove um, with Extinction Rebellion, and then Greta Thunberg, mm. and then there was a, a, a the Parliament declared a climate and ecological emergency. And so this narrative. And then, you know, other countries and councils have declared them as well. And so the narrative is slowly shifting. And mm. it, it, it's gonna, it is taking time, but that, that's over a year already, about 100 councils have declared a climate and ecological emergency. Euro, the European Union has declared one as well. So mm. it's, but in people, I think you're right, in the individual's attention, it's not, because it seems as if everything's still okay, but we still... Yeah, because we're not, because some of us are still not really feeling the effects. We're still going about our daily lives. We're still driving our cars. We're still eating our steaks. We're still, you know, consuming, you know, buying that new coat, buying a new pair of shoes. Having takeaways. Yeah, having takeaways in so many single-use plastic. We're not really, it's not really getting through, is it? Not for us, not for us here, Mm. I don't think. No, it's going to, I mean, uh, yeah, I think it's going to uh, take, yeah, take time for, for some for some things to change. And, and in the media as well, it's not necessarily, I mean, even the, the fires that happening in Australia, the, uh, the, the, we, there was a global hunger strike um, by many of um, Extinction Rebellion activists trying to, Explain or, or, or that the the the, um, the harvest, the global harvest, are quite vulnerable as well. So if there was a um, with the increasing droughts, with the floods, a lot of the grains are also are no longer um, uh, growing as well. And so if, if there's a there's now a, with the 1.5 degree temperature, about 40 percent uh, risk of, glo- of triple global basket failure. And that means that you know we won't get food in the shops, and there won't be bread, there. and and so all this. Because we're, we're working on a quite a vulnerable economic system where everything is delivered just in time. Mm. So if one thing fails, the whole domino effect means everything else will fail. So this. And you kind of feel like you well. w- want that to happen in a way. Maybe that might be the wake up call when people stop getting what they want on demand. Well, when the privileged stop getting yes. what they want, yes. it's one thing for the poor not to have or not yeah. to find what they need. Well, let's face it, you know, that that is the reality of the, the needy, right? Yes. Is they don't get what they want when they need it. But yes. we get more than we need yeah. when we want it, on a whim. Yeah. And I, mm-hmm. you kind of you kind of feel like you need something like that to actually make people wake up. You know, like, you know how people are scared about, you know, with mm. Brexit, that all of a sudden we're not going to have access yeah, to people medicines. Are yeah, aren't people they? have started yeah. to stockpile and all that panic about it mm-hmm. because they think it's going to stop. Well, I kind of feel like that's the kind of message it needs to be mm. get, got they need out to there. need to have that feeling of not being able to get what they want just like yes, that. Yes, yes. That they really do need to think about actually what can we do for ourselves mm. rather than running around. I mean, let's face it, I mean, I mean, this might seem like a silly analogy, but if you think about like the zombie apocalypse and, you know, people who who have to like then suddenly become self-sustaining, you know, if we thought, okay, if something happened tomorrow like that drastic, what would we do to actually be Mm self-sufficient? We couldn't, could we? We wouldn't survive. No, not very well. (laughs) I wouldn't. We need to... 
Sorry, brother, go on. <laughs> <laughs> I like my zombie movies. I'm just... <laughs> zombie movies. Oh, like, yeah, zombie movies. I think we could become one of Yeah, there's, there's a um, Newsnight program where uh, the Sarah London, who's at the political strategy team, she was being interviewed and she was being uh, interrogated, saying, you know, Extinction Rebellion is saying five billion people could die. But, you know, you're just over-exaggerating, mm, mm. making fear-mongering mm. comments. And then there was a scientist there from the IPCC as well. And he said, look, what all we can do is predict the environmental effects. What we can't predict is the social response no. mm, to mm, those impacts. Mm, so when mm. there are no, is no food in the shelves, are we really resilient enough to not start getting really fearful? And, and do we know our neighbours to, like, ask them for some sugar? or, or some, you know, <laughs> sure. to, like, to ask to share things? We don't know. And we're no, like, oh, no, I mean, you just got to think we'll, about we'll, we'll, our old folks who we leave on their own, you know. How would they survive if if there's, you know, shortages? Would we all pull mm. together as a community to make sure everyone's got what they need? Exactly. It makes yeah. you wonder, and doesn't it, and it? I feel there's something about the richer we are, the more separated we are. And I think mm. Islam has something to teach around more around you know the feeding of the poor and that kind yeah. and around the, uh, the social justice aspect mm. is really strong. And I feel that this to create more resilient communities. We need to come together and see ourselves as as support for supporting each other as well, so that when the, you know the proverbial stuff hits the fan, yes, we haven't got the capacity in our communities to actually look after each other, know where we can get our food from, and the the basics. Mm. Yes, yeah, all right. And flooding as well, yeah, and flood, yeah, flood, I mean flooding is a big thing as well. Like the state isn't doing enough. It's, we, we have this idea that the state is meant, you know, is meant to do everything, and, and we, you know, we, we are consumers, and the state has all the responsibility, but it's not doing the things that it needs to do. And mm. in, in some places in, in Yorkshire, they've just had enough, and they began collectivising themselves to actually work out what they needed to do, and they've done much better because they've taken action themselves. Mm. Mm. Um, and so that, that kind of state of thinking needs to start happening in our community. Yes, yeah, something needs to trigger those communities to start working together mm, mm, definitely mm. so there's um last question really so has is there a, a any sort of strategy um to engage the, the muslim community or the or indeed any community really um like we have um organizations like the mcb um is there anything going on at a wider level to try and coordinate or raise awareness um and is it, what, what's happening on that sort of strategic level? Yeah, this is it. <laughs> this is us re- reaching out from the grassroots level. Because I think there's a lot of, there is a lot of reaching out that goes on. On, I mean, for me personally, as a sort of like the, my sort of background with community work and as a lawyer, I, I feel root, rootedness is something that's really important. Rootedness in place and rootedness in community. And the more abstract, the more we start thinking of big political organisations, everything gets really entangled. Right, mm-hmm. right. Like grassroots work, I think, is so important. Like here, we, um, Sister Safia, she did a radio show with uh, a local radio station in Manchester. We, in 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 our group with Extinction Rebellion Muslims, we're connected with um, uh, with IFES, the Eco Islam. Uh, so two of our members mm-hmm. are with Eco Islam. And uh, Muzamal, he, he does a lot of work with permaculture in Islam. Mm-hmm. Um, so, um, and then we also have uh, Shazad, um, Kamran Shazad, who's with, uh, in our, in our, one of our members, who's with the Interface Face of the Climate um, group. And he's been doing a lot of work and advocacy around Islam and um, ecology. And he, um, so they've been, he's, he's um, he has a number of mosques in his congregation that he works with, the Bahu Trust. Um, so we, we're kind of working together. So what was the name of that to, trust, brother? Uh, Barrowwood? The, the Bahu, Bahu Trust, B-A-H-U. Bahu Trust. Oh. And they're based in Birmingham. Okay. Um, and they have a module in their teachings, which is on ecology and Islam, uh, on their website as well. And so it's bringing some of the principles that you spoke about. There's also um, East London Mosque Imam. Um, he gave a talk recently, a uh, khutbah, on Islam and ecology. So there's a kind of awakening up around mm. how to bring these principles, uh, the Islamic principles, and, and see 
how we can act. Um, yes, yeah, I think you sent me, more. you sent some of those links to me, so we'll make sure that yeah, they go we'll on sure our, they're available. That they're yeah. available. Um, and also, so in Luton, we have an XR Luton um, group that mm. are quite active. Their focus, um, one of their focuses is, of course, the proposed expansion of Luton Airport. Mm. Um, um, if people want to get involved with the local activity. Um, yes. Mm. Yes. And you have, um, I don't know who your new MPs are as well, reaching out to MPs as well. Yeah, that's a good idea because they'll be all keen Labour. and willing at the yes, moment because they're, yes. they're both brand new in yes. Luton. So we have uh, two Labour MPs yes, in do. an island of, of uh, blueness. Yes, we do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. And Af Afbal Khan, who's the MP for Manchester, he wrote um, an article actually in the Huffington Post about what Muslims should do you know, if they came together around their principles, you know, it could be a force, a regenerative force for change. You know, we're often on the back foot of uh, Muslims around the blog. Negative image, you know, especially in the media, and to provide a positive story of, like, what these principles are. Mm, brilliant. Uh, the root of yeah. Islam that brings a, a generative story, I think, is really important. OK, Jazakallah, brother. We're fast running out of time on the show. Really do appreciate you calling in. Yes. as Alaikum. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So just to finish off the show, this is the Luton Revet Group. Just to let you know that our next meeting is January the 4th. That's next Saturday from 2 to 4 p.m. at the Dalla Road Community Centre, where we'll actually be just continuing this discussion about how individually we can yeah. affect you know the and environment collectively because yeah. we're a collective absolutely and, um we have yes yeah so please please some uh, literature that you can have a look at yeah. and see what you can do as an individual absolutely okay jazakallah sisters assalamu alaikum listeners Wa alaikum salam. thank you for listening to our podcast we stream our daily broadcast on inspirefm.org you'll find all our daily updates on our social media at Inspire FM Luton.